Hello everyone and welcome back to the People and Tech podcast. Um, we have had an episode for you that's out, but we're thinking of pulling it because it is horrendously bad audio that we prepared while we were on, on our annual honeymoon, isn't it? Um, we'll see. Maybe mm. you'll keep this horrendous one or maybe we'll find some way to make it slightly better. We'll I think just... we just push it. I think there's a lot of value in pushing that. Just I think. no matter how bad it is, right? Uh, yeah. That's right. Oh. Maybe it's just one of those cases we have to say that the substance over style uh, wins. Fine, fine. We'll, 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 we'll just have to do okay. something which is substandard and we'll hate. We have these discussions the on trade offs yes. um, a lot these days, don't we? But we think we're making the right uh, decisions, hopefully, for the most part. Now, mm. um, a, a couple of quick things. Just last night. Uh, um, you wouldn't know when last night is, but just last night, we have had a late night podcast with um, some friends. And we hope to be keeping these conversations going because they, they were genuinely a godsend. It, it kick-started our, our uh, week and our, our um, daily, at least, if not our, our sprint check-in in, in a way like never before because it was super energizing. Um, are you disagreeing with the content or looking at the sound and being worried about something just a quick one no 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 you carry on i'm not worried about anything they looked it no 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 oh, quizzical because i'm looking at something we'll be talking about a bit later but so uh, that's my bad for not concentrating on being in the moment Thank you for saying that, and please thank me back for calling you. Thank for you it. for calling me out on that. Thank you. Otherwise, and you would have been not being lost. stressful and having a moment where we can just throw everything out. Right, that's the one. So it's simple. It is right. Are we leaving the city? <laughs> We yeah. should, we should. So I can see him, just to give you some context for those of you that are only listening, I obviously can see him. Um, and you can do on, on, on Google later, on, on not on Google, yeah, on Google, everything's on Google, isn't it? Um, look on, on our YouTube channel later to see him be distracted, clearly uh, frowning, just as I am telling you that we had an amazing moment with our besties on a podcast. And I'm, like, I'm not, I'm not this is not it going to no. work well. I'm not going to yeah. be convincing anyone it was great when when uh, he, he feels this way physically. So that's why I called him on it. And also because, as everyone knows, I famously want to have every human being um, I've ever met. I'm going to have to pause for a second. I'm, I've received a personal message that is disturbing. I want to mm -hmm. deal with it. And I don't want to pretend it's not happening. So I'm going to just pause this if it's possible. Okay. Or leave. Can I pause instead of stop? Um. Oh, welcome back, everyone. We're back. If we're back. We're back. We hope we're back. So apologies for that, but we wanted to leave it in because it's a, it's a real moment. And I wish more people did that. And I encourage my team to do it whenever they can, which is when something, there is no more clear delimitation between our real, our real lives and our professional lives, right? Mm -hmm. So when life, it's norm, it's, it's normalcy and it's, it's everydayness, uh, but into our professional life and that happens at any point now, they're all in, intricated in ways that they have never been before. Um, I encourage everyone to take a second and figure that out first and not continue anything, right? So if you're on a live call or in a meeting, whatever it is, excuse yourself for two seconds. We used to be able to do that in real life meetings, right? You'd be like, I need to go to the ladies room. These days, you can't even tell you're on a Zoom, you got to go to the ladies rooms. And if you can, if you just disappear without a word, it's a bit bizarre. No one excuses themselves, right? For no reason. And I think it's wrong. I think it, it, it definitely is now adding to these things we need to start putting in place, which are things like let's have shorter meetings, let's have smaller teams, let's close the ranks on human bits, and let's pause it when you have to. And this is an example of that, which is I received a text. I thought it was a bad text from our little one. I obviously, I forgot what we were talking about, what we were going to tell you, what story, what anything. I just went like, oh no, my child. And I could have carried on and done this podcast like I've many times done with, with thinking something horrible is happening to my child in the background because 
unfortunately, my entire working career, I have had to have moments like that. I've had text saying my child is just being rushed to the hospital in an ambulance and I had to get on stage and still deliver a speech or or being told that he's just getting a horrible fever and they don't know what it is and he's had a, um, a bit of a seizure, as little kids would do, right? But I wasn't just down the street. I'd be in another continent, so it would mean two flights until I got to find out. So I had to steal myself for surviving this uncertainty of not knowing if my kids are all right while still delivering on professional things. And I tell you now, that's dumb. And there's no reason to do that. And it didn't help my child, didn't help me, didn't help the people I protected from reality, didn't help anything. So stop work for life and try not to stop life for work is genuinely advice. Anyhow, it wasn't a bad no. text to wrap it up. It was actually a nice text. He had found something. Um, right. Go back to the story. So we had this podcast with our friends. Mm. Which was more of a dinner party. Would you call Virtual it? Virtual dinner party. That's right. Yeah. Or chat. Or, mm. or or drinks. Virtual drink session. And what we normally talk to them about, we talk to them on the podcast as well, which is practically just technology. Mm. We happen to all be uh, married to technology and they are illustrious names. Uh, Brian and Dana Finster and, and Trace and, and Bob Bannon. Um, they are illustriously devs married to ops and... Uh, um, devs married to devs. And devs married to devs, that's right. And they, they have podcasts and enterprises and the name in the community because they've been fighting for practically human debt without knowing that that's what they are or without mm. even categorizing themselves as that for many years alongside us we've known them some years in the community and they are lovely amazing people and we thought you guys have to see the interaction between them as you sometimes are being put through the interaction between us so we got them together at long last and they spoke to us for a while and that should be with you guys this week or last week i don't know when this could mm. come out anymore anyhow how can it be with them last week it can't we can't wrap <laughs> in time no God damn it. I, I was going to uh, take that as a failed sprint. We can't I don't know. If, imagine how productive our sprints would be if we could go back in time. And yeah, at least to delete things. Yeah, because, you know, if you could go back in time, it's the first thing everyone's going to do, isn't it? Just go back to that failed sprint. And delete everything. Well, yeah, yeah start again. That's, that's absolutely going to happen. That would... True. That's not a, a detour or anything. If I had tried a detour like that in the middle of the of the story, you would have had a word with me. You would have had a uh, disappointed face. Your detours are better, though. You like your detours better than mine, which, you know, can't be blamed for. Everyone does. Yeah. Not That's to mention right. mine are colossally long and boring. So. Uh, <laughs> no one said that. Okay, good. So... We talked to them and the topic yesterday was meant to be about other things. How did we all end up being married to tech? What about our kids? Shall we do a play live that one of those that we call um, a teaming play? Let's talk about our kids, our lives, our our um, journeys. And we promised to do that next episode. But now we were taken by, by Brian in the, the middle of it proposed. Have you guys all read the Dora report? Shall we discuss the two surprising findings about practically what he will explain a lot better than I and, and Dave can reiterate, which is the fact that he didn't quite see the CI recognition he would have liked to have seen in the report. And secondly, and maybe most importantly, what we ended up talking about is the finding that TBD um, was found by the Dora report to be connected to burnout. That was kind of the, the headline, right? We hadn't read it at the time we admitted we mm -hmm. hadn't read it. We had known about the same headlines that he was quoting, but not in any depth. And so we we vowed to first read it and then have any informed opinion. All I kept in the podcast repeating was um, burnout is a much bigger context that needs to be seen as an organizational level, at the team level, at an individual level. And we all have responsibility in each of those levels to, to sink it. This is not a technology only problem. Um, but I think I don't know if that point quite resonated with my audience at the time. And what I, what I'd like to use today to do is expound on that. Cause I don't even think that 
Dave is very clear. I I would have felt in the conversation yesterday that Dave, Dave, Brian, Dana, and 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 Tracy and Bob are all kind of probably Bob. I'm not quite sure on Bob yet. I'm presuming now that Bob has a much more overview. Um, no, a much more. I would presume practical view of things. Much yeah, more yeah. Ma- like he works in operations. Yes. So I think Bob and I see things more of a helicoptery way in a way that you four don't because you have been in while you have been in many positions and have seen obviously everything your your primary dev position has cushioned you from organizational matters mm-hmm. to the degree that yesterday's conversation was comfortably what could possibly make you be burn out. And I like that. I let that go. It was the wrong framework, I thought, um, for the level we should be at in mm-hmm. the technology l- level. I thought we need to take our heads out of why do we feel that way and bring it a lot closer to who should be dealing with us feeling different. And I think we did that without realizing it because we started talking about um, the connection between TBD and burnout, which threw us a little bit, and we all had theories yeah. on that. I have a very strong theory that it's practically, if you read my books, my the, my supposition is there will be a higher correlation because all of these higher ways of of delivering technology, the lean methodologies, mm-hmm. coupled with you know the agility we need to show in process, coupled with the cleanliness of code we need to show by doing TDD, by doing a, an ownership-based software development that allows us to be clean, to be payery, they all need us to have an intense human element, which is the hard, difficult bit that makes us burn mm-hmm. out when we get to it. So I've said this all along. I think technologists are a layer that are going to be more affected. But I didn't bring us to that layer mm-hmm. because you guys were so into this is what happened to me. And I wanted to hear those experiences. Right. And yeah, I'll let you I'll let you talk in just a second. Oh, because thank you. you. Yeah, no, <laughs> everyone's waiting for that second when you finally get to you. And I'll ask you for exactly what did you think to prepare with that? What did you think during that conversation? What I yeah. thought was we need to get our head out of how I felt it, how you felt it and allow for there's multiple ways of feeling this. But whatever it is, we can agree on one thing. And that thing is we got to do this human work at the technical level. That was all I took out of it. So it's ecstatic yeah. that the Dora report wrong or right made this conversation happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you've got a good uh, theory and supposition around what that is. And yeah, I think that's definitely got legs. Uh, it's very hard to pierce through the Dora report. And I think you've highlighted that, you know, they asked four questions around well-being of I didn't get oh, but... into it properly. At this time, I'm not sure. I want to yeah. double check this. I want to yeah. check how many they were. But I would be interested to see what amount of mm-hmm. research they used. I presume they used the Aristotle set of questions and they cannot have been a couple. There must have been a few hundred. Oh, okay. um, but even then, like I, it doesn't matter what yeah. amount of questions you have, obviously, right? You might have the one mythical question, uh, like, give oh, me the key to it. your heart. <laughs> doesn't matter, right? See straight into their hearts and see the burnout. Yeah. Um, I'm not even describing like, or rather, I'm not attacking how many questions, what the set was necessarily, but I am hoping that it has in built mm-hmm. these big contexts, right? The organizational context, the team context, the individual context, and all of the Aristotle research at the minimum. At the end of the day, this is the Dora report. So surely they got that bit clear. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. figure that out over the next week or so. Yeah. But anyways, for you, that conversation, right. talking about these things, right? Clearly, talk, just from, from you are the latest to come to the table, <laughs> to the table of fighting human debt yeah. in that group, right? If you look, maybe you and Bob are the latest, if you wish. Mm-hmm. But but everyone was a reluctant comer at their time. <laughs> I do think everyone does come to this subject uh, reluctantly. Uh, maybe we'll touch on that a little bit later on, but you know, the stereotypical view of the developer, mm. and you know, I think we touched on this one before as well, actually, of how that developer role has changed from being that jack of all trades. Right, the project used to be, you know, end to end. A developer, a single developer, could take a product end to end. Uh, and now unless it's the smallest, simplest of things, that's just impossible to do. And to fit that into a large enterprise, again, is, you know, just joking. So... 
Are you this... saying, just to clarify for me, not being yeah. facetious, and, and I completely agree if you are, but correct me if I'm wrong, that they, they've lost that ownership. The end-to-end ownership has disappeared in the fact that they became a clog in the machine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can remember, you know, some of those first things I worked on when I was, you know, a com- commercial Lone Wolf programmer rather than just a toy missing in my Spectrum and Amigas programmer. Uh that I was working in pretty much isolation on some of those things. And that was fun, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, because you're much easier. As I said, you know, you've touched on before, it's a lot easier to get into flow. You've got a single process, you've got a single target. But at the same point, this was, what, 88? Something like that, I think. Yeah. 88. Look, mm-hmm. I get it. I would have um, liked to have been a developer. And the world was, that. you know, yep. a much more different place then as well. And I can remember... You know, the manuals we have to get, right? You know, just pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of books and dead trees everywhere. I think we and... have a bunch of these still uh, as trophies in, in your oh, office. Who can... <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, like, every time I go to the, the tower of books I've got in there, it's just like, I don't want to feel like I'm a 1930s book burning Nazi, just, you know, just throwing we'll, them away we'll for go, the sake. We'll take a couple of the pictures of the Dave Farley's were trying to not burn, but at the same time, that, that's, yeah. I'm lying. Those are some of the, the real DevOps tenants are thin, I think. That's hilarious. The truth is, if you put a tome of all of the manuals and all of the um, Agile for Dummies and all of the real ones and all of the non-real ones together, but you also put the tome of, but what do I really need so that I get this stuff? Yeah. It will very clearly have a much thinner layer. But who who is capable to see where that value is, where that layer is? So then you become either stacked with useless information or you become, this becomes diluted. We've discussed this almost every episode. But at the time, we needed it. We all had to go through this. We yeah. had to go through the tomes and, and distill it. We're the ones that throw the distilled bits. Let's be honest, right? Yeah. Because we need to stop the modesty somewhere. But what we've done is, despite the fact that we've inundated the world with content, some of us, we still haven't even touched the, the corners of explaining to people that are stuck in those tomes, in those manuals. They remember how to do business by uh, A, B, C, always be closing. Or always start with an intro, have 20 pages and a template from some well-meaning character in the street. Who knows? Yeah. Right? But those tenants have, you're right, have changed. I'll let you get back to the story. I'll shut up for a second. Okay. Yeah. No. But, yeah, taking it from that lone wolf programmer, developer, where you're responsible for everything, and you had no mean of support from you know a wider online community in any way, shape or form, were tough. Right. If something didn't work, you know, we can now spend 10 minutes seeing it didn't work and then off onto, you know, chat GPT, uh, Stack Overflow, something, something, something. But back in them days, you were done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's nowhere to turn. Uh, and I can remember, uh, yeah, just one of those weird buggy issues you just couldn't get around when the framework I was using was just flashing blue rather than yellow or something and it's just like now what the freaking hell do i do yes don't get there but now with everything being put into the team and everything being everyone else's responsibility does that get diluted does that sense of ownership get diluted does everyone if you've got a team of five developers does everyone feel 20 percent of the ownership or does everyone feel 100 percent of the ownership Hmm. And they have to, because your biggest argument, counter argument that you encounter over and over again, and this is your live sales training, let's face it, right? This Mm -hmm. conversation we're having, we don't have any other time to have to churn through these concepts as well as we do together. It's why we have this platform. We finally arrived at this. Just last week, I was screaming at everyone, I believe, if I remember correctly, something towards, and I don't, I have to admit, that was quite an intense period we've, we've gone through. But just last week, I was absolutely screaming from the, the depths of my soul that you will never outcode chat GPT. Yeah. Um, I still believe that you will never outcode chat GPT. So where we're going towards mm-hmm. it is an even, so whatever you're describing is increasing and it's getting well, chat GPT as it is now. Yeah. Right. You know, it's still, 
Oh, wait, I didn't Take mean that. chat GPT, obviously. I meant right. you won't in three or four years forever no, outright, right. yeah. outright or outcode AI, okay? This is not yeah. even about coding. This is take it, come, come down, everyone. It's not about the developer communities. Speaking of which, I'd like us to take this one step backwards and say the donor report became a tool for the business community only when some of us in the agile community noticed it and started going oh sorry excuse me this is this thing they have over here in the technology sphere that applies just fine to banking as well and that's just exactly the same thing in pharma and that is mm -hmm. that is how the community starting the business community started understanding where psychological safety is coming from what the deal is with the with the google is total project if it hadn't been for the dora report maybe it would have been harder because it's all these ctos that practically brought it into the organization and went this is a thing and i've said this all along it's historically important to the kind of growth and and my observations of the of the of the anthropological nature of the agile co uh, industry and community but outside of that and you can find that in my second book that everyone found too complicated and no one's reading to the tune of under 100 pounds like i told you in the other episode uh, <laughs> uh right <laughs> no one sees it to get in your no. now we're, uh, side by side he was actually uh pointing to one of the books not the new one which you can see right there let's do that there we go but the older one <laughs> I don't think anyone's even looking at this, but anyhow, if they are, that those are the books we need you to please purchase so go. that we make more than a hundred pounds ever. You should do this one. Like, oh. <laughs> I promise we did not. We wouldn't have. I'm so sorry. Are you all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. But you stabbed in the back I'm by my the... book. I know. <laughs> at the, if I was a gambling man, well, I'd say there was you know, a suspicious man at very least. I would say there was definitely something uh, in that. But I'm not. So I'm going to put that down to a pure accident and pure For idiocy of my own Only point. listening to this, uh, Dave was being a supportive uh, CEO and per uh, showing you what you could purchase because he has been not even telling you about the software that you could purchase at all, but he was putting my book right next to him, behind him, and it fell. And it not only fell, but he very poisley and did what those uh what he must have seen that uh models on a podium do and continued walking Absolutely. <laughs> with my books the <laughs> show must go on and it's not <laughs> it was quite yeah the show must go on but we've taken about a three minute diversion to explain that so. that's right that's right yeah uh, anyhow so that, which, which is why it's better to maybe look at us than listen to us because we're more boring in, in listening to us but I, we don't know if we are boring. Right back. Are we boring? Are we? Can we cut some bits? Can we? Actually, don't tell us what we should be doing. I don't give a flying what you think. So, um, I lie. I give a flying what you think. I wish we all thought good things, yeah. right? But anyways, back to this conversation with our friends, right? Dave has been there, lived through that. I think he's the newest to the uh, to the idea of human dead. I also don't think that Bob had had the name for it, and he, mm -hmm. I don't know that he's always thought of it that way. Um, so obviously, maybe the maybe that Bob is the newest to it. I would say because Mr. Valentine had three years of intense training in EQ. Mm -hmm. um, what human that is? He has edited books, let them stab him in the back, and learned mm -hmm. all these concepts. And the books I edited have not stabbed me in the back. <laughs> no. However, I I want to maybe you guys didn't understand in my conversation last week, but he has been he's made a lot more than cups of coffee. Man, many of these concepts have been passed between us. We've discussed the topic of burnout from every possible angle while this has been written. A lot of research has went into what do we know so far? What has Microsoft found out? What has GitHub found out? What has Google given us? Because Google again mm -hmm. for the billionth time. The most amount of research we have comes from the Aristotle project and the, um, what's the other one project? And the leadership yeah. one project, it always escapes the name. So the two of them are what Google has given us on a bigger set of data than we have from any other enterprise. And we, if it leaves us with nothing other than mm -hmm. search and, and the workplace knowledge, they, they've done enough for humanity. So, um, I'm big, a big fan of the Dora report. I hope that none of this is necessarily true, that they said trunk-based development burns you out. But here's my theory. What if it does? They said there's a correlation. Okay. Let, let, let's pick the words let's, let's... right. There is a, they have reported a correlation between using trunk-based development and, 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 and higher burnout. And we, what if we agree that it is higher? And what if we then, again, 
I, I tell you, I believe I have said, and you might be able to com convince me otherwise, because you're the one that remembers my books better than me sometimes. I believe I have said this many times. And I remember I said this on a call with Tracy years and years ago when we met, which is techies are going through a bigger and more immediate burnout than we can measure. It's bigger than other people because they've had intense, an intense period of intellectual burnout pre-pandemic. And they are having an intense period of emotional burnout during pandemic and post pandemic because mm -hmm. of how they are now, which is not because of the pandemic only. It's because of where technology happens to have landed. We have started with the, the techies who are now in their 40s and 50s are people who have gone through generations of learning, generations of code, generations of world changing around mm -hmm. them. Uh, it, the, the impact of have us having gone from some of most of us paper to digital, most of us from analog to digital, most of us from command and control to servant leadership, most of us from this is how selling works to who knows what works and it's only connecting and passion. Um, and yes, most of us from coding or writing in a corner to having to do intensely human activities together where we pair program, we talk to each other, we podcast, we are honest, we show authenticity and it started with little plates on Instagram and it never got them went away. Mm -hmm. And now we have to open and bear our souls in, even in a professional fashion. It's fucking uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. We are untrained. We don't know how it has finished us. It has burnt us out more than other. I believe it absolutely mm -hmm. a million percent. And you know what? Maybe they don't have the data to prove it, but they're onto something. And it is 100% where it's going. And the dollar report with or without the paper would have then proven the fact that there is human debt in the world. And the, this human debt is burning the technology world faster than anywhere else because it is a tech-led culture. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. <laughs> All right. So other than that... We got nothing. Uh, no, 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 no. There, there was some... And actually, just on the subject of burnout, uh, I don't know if you read this line, but it was talking about documentation and quality documentation. And let me quote from the line here again then. However, increasing documentation... This You're is what cheating. I was Are you reading from it now live? I never had it open. The, the, this is what I was looking at earlier when you said uh, you're looking quizzical at something. Yeah, but okay. But that's still not yeah. fair. You're still cheating. You never told me we're doing it. I'm doing it blind. You just got it all in your head, though. No, I don't. Okay. Well, look. Okay. What does it say? Let me know. We're asking you for your opinions. Yes, blind. So you don't need that. In this all right. So, increasing documentation quality doesn't lead to a better well-being for everyone. As the quality of documentation increases, some respondents report increased levels of burnout. Of course, they hate it. They hate doing that. Who wants to write documentation? Nobody. Who wants mm. to do admin? Nobody. Who wants to pull up the phone and make a sale? Nobody. Let me tell you, these shitty parts exist in every job. Yeah. Yes. Other than they say quality documentation is foundational. Absolutely. Yeah, but no one likes doing it. And everyone gets burnt out by doing it. So, why so what's don't going we then, on? What, it doesn't matter what's going on. Why don't we just outsource this completely to AI? Mm -hmm. Strip it. Take it away from them. If they never liked it. Take it away. If we have a, a golden opportunity to allow people to be creative and human. Free them from the shit that's easy to free them from. The mm -hmm. automation, the, the lack of having resources, the lack of training. Free them from that. Yeah. Yeah. Take away the shit that burns them out. Cheap at it. What else? Tell me what else goes up. I'll tell you right now. When they have to uh, give handovers, it they'll improve. Uh, uh, but I, I think without reading the shit, it's completely blind. And I'll tell you now, yeah. they, the devs will not like it when you make them talk to others. You, yeah, they have too many meetings. We've done this for the last five years. Yeah. They are too busy. They are, um, what is it? They are, these are the, these are the things they're telling you, right? They are, uh, not having any time. Those are the, what they're telling you. But what they really mean is I, you, you, you pulled me out of flow 
And if you pull me out of flow a certain amount of time that I feel is fair and mm -hmm. I owe it to you because I, I made this contract with you that I'll be out of flow doing X, Y, and Z with you, I'll give it to you. Because that structure, that's clarity, you want to depend on me, mm -hmm. I want to depend on you. It's, it ticks all the Aristotles. For me, it ticks all the Aristotles for you. I'll come and do that. Yeah. Anytime you pull me out of flow because I had to fucking fix something else that I perceive is a favor to you, a enterprise or team or product owner, because it ain't my job and I hate it and fuck you. Take your testing elsewhere and take your fucking documentation elsewhere and take any time you and me talk to a human elsewhere because those are the mm -hmm. times that I'm doing you a favor because the only time you brought me here for is to be in flow. That is the reaction you get. That's the, the very, at the very core of this is what Dora has caught probably is a figment of fuck you team, fuck you enterprise for making me do something McKinsey calls the outer loops. Yeah. Let me tell you, there's correlation between these two things. Neither of these things are right, but they're all sensing human debt. So McKinsey, the outer loops is not wrong. It's, it's just not right. No, McKinsey's outer loops exist. Shit developers don't like exist. All of these things are activities outside the flow, like documentation writing, like doing testing, like talking to other people, like having to do whatever is admin and you don't want to do. All of those bits you don't want to do that are outside the flow are outer loops mm -hmm. fucking burn you out and make you feel some kind of way because they're all needed if you do trunk-based development. Let me tell you. Yeah. Yes. When you have ownership end-to-end -end and you care about what the fuck you make, you're going to need to do all of those and you'll hate it and you'll be burnt out. Yeah. yeah? And you'll be less productive when you're burned out as per the outer loops of our friends McKinsey. Yeah. And this is the time for us developers and tech community to go, yeah, that's what's happening. Now you can either pay me better and understand my limits or I won't show up correct. I won't give you good code anymore. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, it makes, makes perfect, perfect sense, I think. It does to me and you yeah. does it to anyone else. I don't know. That's what we're trying to bat. That's that's the team we're batting for, though, right? And that's the message we're drilling in and drilling in and drilling in. And tell them and tell them and tell them again. And really, Go back to Aristotle. Get it all measured. Yes. Get it. Understand what it's about. See developers with a different lens. Treat people as humans. It's not difficult. It shouldn't be. No. It shouldn't be. We'll do this for the next 20 years, so you can come no. back and listen to us next time. But, I mean, what I would like us to get is, like, a couple of developer stories. I think we even had some of those. <gasps> do you think we can kind of get one developer story or two developer stories in here if you find them in our recordings? Yeah. I'm sorry, sure we can do. Do some stuff about when you were uh, first starting out in Chatham. There was some stuff about my first beginnings in seeing developer teams in Sweden, I think yeah. there was one. Yeah, yeah, we should get those in if we can. Listen, you guys, if we find those, they will be inserted right here. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. This is what I saw there. Yep. Okay, so you so went to a Swedish I, office block. We started working technology since <laughs> I graduated high school or even before that in ways or others. It was mm -hmm. more on the, I don't know, kind of general side of it. Yeah. Whereas this was the first time my first time ever kind of coming very close to the psychology of developers, if you wish. Right. And this is for a Swedish company. No. Um, yeah, a Swedish company run by an American uh, guy called, I don't know if you want me to call him or not, but I can ask him. Um, and he, he had de developed practically a, a genius thing. He had developed a DHCP6 engine. At this time, probably mm -hmm. means absolutely nothing to no one. It didn't mean anything to me at the time either. Uh, probably didn't mean anything to many people at all, because no one knew what IPv4 was, forget what IPv6 was. Yeah. And IPv6 was a, a dream, a distant dream at the time that we are having this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so he was going around telling people, the world of internet is going to change. All of your infrastructure is going to be kind of fucked. Would you please have this other thing yeah. uh, that I have made for you? And they all went, well, I don't be 
because one, none of that is happening too soon, two, that would be too big of an investment, three, there are competitors of yours that have a lot more money that have made this. Yeah. Ironically, one of his competitors was a company called Men and Mice making DHTP as well. They had the VP of sales briefly called Georg Ludwigsson. <laughs> Somewhere else in the world, yeah. with an unbeknownst to the two of us, we were competing. Well, I'm sorry, yeah. It's hilarious. And then, but we didn't know this until years and years later, yeah. Georg and I. Um, who then later obviously became my boss as the CEO of Meniga. Anyhow, at this time, I'm in, I'm in Sweden and I'm entering this vast office building um, with, with, in, oh God, now, now that I realize that all of these things mean so many other things, right, in, in the right light. So, the uh, vast office space, but in it, various spaces had had what looked like a, an um, organic growth <laughs> to extend themselves from being a potential. Each of these developers could have easily had one office to themselves, maximum two people <coughs> in an office, uh -huh. if they wanted to. They were that those kinds of long rooms, perhaps half of this. You know what I remember. You remember what I want about where you could easily put two desks and still have room around them yeah. so two developers could happily and that was the and some execs would have just one some developers would have two in them yeah. well let me tell you this imagine this picture is that same size of a room that now instead of having two big desks with their back to each other so developers face each other yeah. and work they were having four desks next to each other on the length of the side of the window of this room and all four of them were aligned yeah and working. Uh -huh. No one had set them up like that. And I never even questioned until today why they were like that, considering the space in the room and the configuration of every other room that didn't have developers in there. Yeah. So let me tell you, I think they gravitated towards this model. I think they naturally formed themselves into this model. Yeah. I don't think Badmir would ever said, you're in a team with me, you're in a team with him. I think these people just kind of grew that product like that mm -hmm. by chatting to each other and standing up and looking over the other guy's shoulder for 20 seconds of pair programming and that they had banter, they had the same music, each room had a different type of radio they liked to listen to. Mm -hmm. These were Swedish developers so they would often kick off their shoes before starting to develop which made me sweat and never be able to bring a corporate client over mm -hmm. unless I convince them to put them back on which I have done over my career for multiple Icelandic companies um, Please put your shoes on I'm dead serious I, I would have to you go no I understand why you want your shoes off before now I need everyone to look profesh because these fuckers are coming from England and they don't understand you need to be comfortable the yeah. amount of times I have to say that <laughs> uh -huh. and I had wrongly believed that all these all developers everywhere have this kind of molly coded you know kind of situation where work started at nine and ended on the dot at five uh -huh. but equally there was a fika break at ten a fika break is a wellness have tea have that is uh -huh. almost religious across various institutions in Sweden don't get me started though because this is why it gets bad yeah. this is where well-intentioned things get bad is when that fika thing applies in a hospital while people are dying as well yeah yeah anyways in a programming environment though let me tell you it's fine you can afford it yeah. that they have a tea and a coffee and then they get back to work put their head down for um, solo of, work yeah. for a couple of hours yeah. and then they would emerge for lunch a mandatory team lunch. Everyone and their dog would seem to me like a mandatory one, mm -hmm. seem to them like a perk. Everyone and their dog was putting their shoes back on and walking regimentedly, and it wasn't just our office, it was all other office buildings were walking regimentedly to the lunch halls mm -hmm. where people would have a beer, a type of lingon berries and some, some, some meatballs, and have this conversation about either life, very little was changing in life, yeah. how the kids still good, great. 
How about this problem? How yeah. do we make this new thread work? Because I keep getting this error. Mm -hmm. And they would finish this and they would go back down for an hour or two and towards three or four, they would have a lengthy, what I would call chatty meeting, a lot more animated, maybe mm -hmm. a laugh or two over a coffee. And then they'd kind of decide what they do tomorrow and they would go the fuck home. And the code these people had churned had made this other type of internet, mm -hmm. this DHCP v6 thing. Yeah. And let me tell you, a lot less people than I'm comfortable to tell you because I don't remember what we were saying to the market. But let's just say they were comfortably under two teams if they were to have been organized like that. Mm -hmm. But they looked like they would have been comfortably 2000 as our competitors were. Yeah? Mm -hmm. This is why they, they did that. Because they had a life they adored. Yeah. They were potentially doing TDD, potentially doing TBD, potentially yeah. doing all the pairings in a natural way that still allowed them to do loads of their flow and to have loads of their regimented simple pleasures. I still think that's the perfect isotope for yeah. developers. But that world does not exist. <clears throat> no society affords that world because these people are practically in a club and mm -hmm. functional for maybe a day or two a month but that entire day or two were at the level that no other teams could yeah meanwhile they had friendship and some work mm -hmm. and that's what people are productive at who can afford that because then with today's political correctness madness and lack of being able to gravitate and lack of well-being and all of that you need a billion instead of 12 that's what's happening yeah that's why you're bloated it's because you don't know how to make this environment for your developers and then now you, your developers are inserted into the end-to-end -end ownership idea and they're incapable unwilling because they heard of these places in Sweden where they could just eat lingon berries yeah. and unprepared. So we need to fix that. Okay. That's all. Yeah. And how do we replicate that in a remote work environment? I mean, it sounds ideal. I'm very jealous. That's it. And it doesn't exist. It only exists in this insane society where they... Okay, let, let's, let's, let's be clear. This is an economical problem. The reason you can't organize people like that, yeah, is because we do not have the amount of money it would take to have that hundreds of thousands of people be productive only at their best, yeah? So we need to kind of force them to be yeah. productive at other times, yeah? When no one here is, is, is saying, let people only have one million millisecond of brilliance all their lives and wait for that one and pay them meanwhile. I'm not insane, right? Yeah. You have to ask a minimum amount of unpleasant effort alongside the happiness. I'm, oh, yeah. I've never said otherwise. And people have to have some adulthood, some professional deontological sense, some, mm. some ethics, some common sense. But outside of that, if you make the... Big, Tweak that. How much do you need to put from money and understanding and, 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 and per organizational permission versus and, man, and, and, and tools versus how much do they need to put from their personal responsibility and meet in the fucking middle and find a responsible place. But I hold both parts responsible, not the organization only. It's the developers that don't agree that it is the Lingenberries they're after. Yeah. It's the people who don't say, this is too much for me. I don't, you brought me, I don't know what meeting I'm in. Mean. Well, I'm doing you a favor, you're in a product meeting, so that you fucking understand what these product owners know that the client wants. What? I'm just bothered, why am I here? I just want to be, fuck you, I want to write code. I don't want to be in this meeting, I don't want your ownership. Mm -hmm. I don't care what this product does to the end consumer. So now I think we need to go, each of your developers have to be, has to be told about Project is Total and tell them each of these bits are a, bit, a little bit your responsibility as well. How are we doing for dependability? None mm. of my problems. Yes, it is. Are you dependable? Yeah. How is structure and clarity? Well, I don't fucking know about those. You do. Did you? Were you very clear? Who's your boss? Do you know for a fact 
when you need to do this pa uh, um, Passover to whatever it's called, to quote. Or like, you know, psychological safety doesn't matter to me. Don't be fucking ridiculous. Or I don't care about my impact. I just sit here and write code. But that's on you. You're an asshole. You should. Yeah. That we need an episode about developers' responsibility towards the Aristotle pledge. The Aristotle pledge for everyone. Mm -hmm. Both organizations and developers. That's what it needs to be. The Aristotle Project Pledge. Just fix each of these, asshole. Yeah. And we know just how. Yeah. <coughs> well done, baby. We fix the world again. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we don't find those, let's uh, let's pretend we never said that, and we'll get yeah. them in the next episode. Okay. Yep. We'll certainly do that. All right. But here's. Another stat, which I'm not sure it's surprising, but the number's big, right? And I'm, this is when it's talking about failed deployments. Mm -hmm. Now, performance level of elite, let's start at the top. Deployment frequency on demand, change lead time less than one day, change failure rate 5%, still seems quite high. Uh, fail, failed deployment time, recovery time, one hour, less than one hour. And 18% of respondents are doing that. So well done, all of those people. Yeah. Right? That's trunk-based development. That's flow. That's TDD. That's testing. That's all your good bits put in place. And perhaps exactly. even a psychological safe team. Maybe even, if, if you're lucky. Now, on the flip side of that, if we go down to the low-performance team, which, let's assume this is 1980 six, seven, eight practices, deployment frequency between once per week and once per month. And even once per week it was, who is was quite ambitious that? sometimes. Who, in some, who is doing that today? Yeah, no, in some enterprises, once per week is unheard I'm of. I'm sorry, some enterprises? Most. Well, what is the percentage? Because you can look at that data in front of you. You know what percentage of enterprises uh, percentage they presume. Of, okay. okay, so this is 17 so 17% of respondents are doing that. Yeah. But are what percentage of enterprises level. were respondents? Let's not forget you have top performance in the DORA report. Yeah, There absolutely. are several thousands of the best organizations in the world. This is the top of the, the, the top cream of the, of the crop. Yes. And, and the cream of then, the crop of the, trim of the crop still, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps there is a big... So maybe these numbers are skewed but because we're picking the cream of the crop and not... Joe Blow software team down the road. And there is some of the Joe Blow software team down the road <laughs> element, of course, as well. I don't. I would doubt that the that the that the segmentation of the respondents is an, an an okay because if anything, they know what to do is kind of make sure not only that these findings are good, but that yeah. they extrapolate. Well, yeah, look, the I'm industry. no statistician, but anyway. No, we're not, but we yeah. still believe that them to be correct. But what we do say is. Is there a skew towards performance? And there is, let's face it. Yeah. 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 Anyway, let's carry on. So the change lead time between one week and one month and the change failure rate right, is massive 64%. So you're telling me nearly, you know, seven out of 10 deployments fail in those enterprises. How is that not soul sapping? Well, can I ask you something and, else? Yeah, yeah. I can attack that. You might not like, or I might be wrong. This is a good one live. We would yeah. have discussed that. Why is it maybe those deployments were part of an agile process of them failing fast? Uh, no, because the failed deployment recovery time is get this between one month. And six months. So did, I'm, I'm lost. What is a failed recovery? To get you back to a working state. Of what? No. Yes. No. I mean, again, right? So you're saying in this batch, they didn't calculate all the little experiments. Because then if that's how many are failing, that's great. It just means they're learning. No, no. No, no these are unintentional. No. These right. would have wanted them let's, to Let's be... think about this. If you experiment, how often do you deploy? 
Oh, so you mean non-UAT conversations, yeah. post-UAT failures? Um, I'm assuming this is all production systems, could be wrong. But that's what I'm asking, because it makes a no, massive, no, no, no. massive difference. Okay. Because if it is what I think, it just shows you those people are doing testing and are moving fast. Yeah, I don't think it's making any limitation here, but I don't think that is what they mean. But do you see how opposite these two can be? Yeah. Post UAT, great, they're doing agile. Past UAT, are they fucking kidding? Everything's crap. Yeah. But no, I, I would assume that this is just production. You know, let's come back to this. And and let's uh, if, make it a mark point and okay. come back to it. And even then, if you're deploying to UAT using these manual fashions, which let's assume the low performing teams are doing, you can't do that with a experimentation AB process. Okay, now you lost me and I won't I won't the turn, the, or against the lead time is simply not it's fast a, enough so okay. for you to be able to do experiments. So you're saying that the, the, the timings you're reading are saying that they, there's no way that they could be these could be quick popcorns I'm talking about. Absolutely. Well product owner says, Hey, if we change this from green to red yeah how many more people buy and we'll say we can tell you in six months oh no one's using experiment i'm only talking about popcorn technology experiments i'm right. not insane enough to think that anyone's popcorn experimenting in sales with tech yeah i mean we're talking much bigger enterprises no. would never have happened i'm talking about you know I, this is maybe important every time we we talk about something, we should maybe, in when it comes to technology of teams, it's really important to me that we start showing what the delimitations we presume are, but we equally start attacking them. Mm -hmm. And in our case, it's easy because we have to do that live with each other. But here's how I think about it in my autistic mind, right? You have technology and then you have, to my mind, this big technology, circle contains data yeah contains mm -hmm. ops contains sec if you mm -hmm. wish to think of them that maybe contains i'm forgetting someone hardware or something else I, this is all soft and i suppose there's mm -hmm. like some hard component of tech as well sorry about that everyone in the minor. manufacturing industry <laughs> yeah no, minor cloud <laughs> No, but that's a different dimension to it of it to me, right? So in this in this big pot of tech, you have these big um, kind of concepts. Yeah. And then as you come into the industry, you'll find if as a newcomer into the industry, what I found was, um, or I never knew I was a newcomer to the industry, but apparently I was. So the the and the industry in my mind was, you know, the tech community. Well, let me tell you, there is no such thing as a tech community. It's as real as Santa. There is no mm -hmm. such thing. The, what there are, there are pockets that don't even correspond to these, like, big, necessarily correspond to these big areas we just talked about. They are pockets that kind of cut through, but they don't even cut through, I then found out, in a, in a parallel way, so that you can kind of figure out what's what. Maybe it's per regions. Maybe it's per philosophies. Maybe it's per anything of value. Maybe it's per the way we 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 congregate or we work or we maybe it's the time it's none of that it's there it cuts in every which direction and it's a community that's a tech community and doesn't know it is yeah. what i found right what i found is a data community a security community uh at best what i thought okay well let me go a step higher for good god's sake this is insane uh, a DevOps community, which that is, I, if I'm honest, the one where I, my heart went the most. Those were the most human mm -hmm. dead fighters. They knew the most. They tried the most. They had tried everything. It's almost like the more advanced type of human lived in the DevOps community, I thought. That kind of intersects with the agile community. But this agile community became kind of who is old school for the um, um, religiously okay. for the manifesto or isn't. And just kind of became religious and stuff. And it all now is becoming attacked by, in my mind, by this new generation uh, that is maybe not, not, not wrongly coming from other sides of tech. And let me tell you what side of tech they think they're coming from. They'll tell you they're prod. Yeah. These are new kids that will tell you they're in prod. 
they're not, they're developers, early developers who knew they have to have end-to-end, -end, who were realized Aristotle kind of exists, who are curious about life and learned quickly how awesome Agile was, caught on to all the things and others, and then swiftly moved from development into into product. And now they're getting it. They yeah. are the new type. And in my view, product owners and product developers is all you're going to have. The development um, job as it is today will not exist, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can protect it in a we corner might. We've seen it. We've already seen it, right? Chat GPT, build me a system that does X. Then what does a developer have to do? You know, and if you think about the tech debt we've got and does tech debt exist in an AI driven world where it can just simply replace itself? Get everything as long as right. it, yeah. Well, not get everything right, but can simply replace itself. Does it remember the tests we put it through it? Does it remember, you know, all those different nuances, right? And I think still got to adhere to the laws of garbage in, garbage out. Oh, yeah. But and common sense and uh, adulthood and maturity and all personal responsibility. That's like AI doesn't care about that. They don't start me at the end of the uh, episode. Right. Uh, anyway, right. We do need to wrap up. We I really will don't... just say, actually, let's wrap up. But going back to this change failure rate, sixty-four percent is hideous. The cost to the enterprise. Let's not worry about the people. Right. We the... never do, do we? No. Uh, but having to roll back 64% of your changes, you know. What money does to... that cost? Then? Exactly. Well, it's... Right, systems down, roll back. They're not click your fingers. How did it fail? Right? And I've, you know, almost had some robust discussions, so we say, on, you know, database deployment scripts and how they roll back. And... We it would met, cost. You haven't written the rollback scripts, and it's just like, I don't even, right, depends which stage this goes wrong at. Right? What how, what data has sort of been half bathed through this? And I'm not necessarily saying we need to wing it. And I don't even know right. what exact uh, example you're on, but why have, to continue your point, why haven't you as an enterprise kept an eye on it, and how has it not crippled you? Why was this so uncoupled from your day to day that you could just leave with it and cover it and. That's where this intersection between you and I will, I hope, become super powerful to those listening to us. Is mm. because I can translate what that means to like to an enterprise, and you can translate what that means to a developer. Yeah. And the, I think we should keep doing that as much as we can. But I think this failure rate should be something that a developer themselves knows about, mm -hmm. and should be something that a product owner cries about. It should be yeah. something that an enterprise is worried about because it's human debt. Mm. But what the Dora report says is you get this failure rate that Dave is talking about. It starts by saying, as ever, it has always done this, by saying what we see as the bigger correlation between elite and success development and, and performance and, and uh, mm -hmm. is, is very clearly the state of your culture that says that unequivocally and i yeah. think that is the biggest gain that we are clear that if tech wants to move tech needs to look at culture but look at culture will not mean bring some new episodes about mm -hmm. purpose in or it will mean f absolute things things like everyone pledging like the hippocratic oath to abide by the Aristotle Google findings personally mm -hmm. and as a company or as a team at all levels. Yeah. And Absolutely. then we can go somewhere. Yeah, and I, I think it feels like we're picking apart the door report, and I think maybe you know, maybe that's to its credit. We right? aren't, we aren't at all. Ninety eight percent of this we're just like if someone's saying, How can my enterprise perform better? That <laughs> Exactly. So if we say, you know, we know that the people listening to this have the discerning power of knowing, uh, and I will repeat this in writing for as many days as necessary from here on. Again, at the end of the episode, if it had not been for the DORA report, we would not be where we are in the business world, not in the, in the, in the 
technology world, in the business world. And, you know, I take some credit, I will, because I have banged on and on alongside others that this is the Dora, this is the findings that Dora shown in the report to matter from the Google Aristotle because they have then expanded it. So if it hadn't been for that, we would not have psychological safety in every HBR report uh, and then psychological safety from every Forbes genius that paid them 400 pounds to be in a council and uh, every newspaper copy and pasting things we've said a billion years ago. So it is absolutely to the credit of the tech community, of the DevOps community, of the Agile community, of the Dora community and of the researchers behind the, 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 the Google Aristotle project that we are where we are today. And it's not much where we are and we have fuckloads more of human debt, but the fact that we can all live another day and attempt to fight it is thanks to these pioneers. Um, we, we, we left you with some big ones over there. Again, I've only said mm -hmm. what I've only said, what I've always said, which is bigger human debt in tech companies, it will come to bite us faster because we live in a tech led culture. So, um, see you next time and hopefully you enjoyed listening to us and you're subscribing. See you soon. Buy the book, buy the bloody software, the change book. the world, yeah. fight human debt. Bye. Bye bye everyone.